Well, last week we started in um, Leviticus 10, talking about uh, Nadab and Abihu. And uh, the Lord was faithful. That's all I can really say about that. In the midst, he is always faithful. You know, and he uses the weak things of this world to confound the wise. Every time I preach, I uh, quote that verse to myself. The foolish things to confound the wise. But, um, excuse me, Dad had called, uh, called me actually that day and asked um, if I would kind of continue on in that because I didn't get to everything I wanted to say. It's kind of the way of things. You can't, you can't know everything, number one, because you're human. We're not all knowing. And uh, so you can look at these same passages, and the Lord Racine would uh, uh, give you revelation uh, pertaining to different things, um, because there's a contextual reality, and then there's a spiritual reality, and there's a distinguishing between those two things, as the disciples on the road to Emmaus found out. What they thought the scriptures meant in their fullness was not what the scriptures meant in their fullness. Jesus had to come along and teach him a thing or two, basically. And he did. And he uh, you know, basically told him that this all speaks of me. And uh, I think it's important for us to remember, especially in the Old Testament, with dispensationalism uh, being so prominent and prevalent in our time, that, excuse me, Romans 15 is really true. These things were written for our sake, to teach us. It's not just history. There's a spiritual reality. Though there is fulfillment in Jesus, this still speaks and testifies of Jesus Christ just as much, if not more, now than it ever did. In a real way, the Old Testament is just, since the coming of the Lord, making sense. That makes sense. They didn't know what it meant back then. They didn't know why they had to do all the rigmarole they had to do in the law. They just knew it was what was prescribed. And now we can see the fulfillment of that in Christ Jesus and who he is. Um, so we're going to continue on uh, a little bit in that and then get a little bit more into um, a few different things. But look, my whole, uh, my whole thing is to encourage people to become the bride of Christ. And that is not an outward thing that can be accomplished by the flesh. That's an inward reality and a work by the Spirit that deals with conformity, that deals with likeness, that deals with kind. And uh, I personally um, am here on this earth for that fulfillment in my own heart, given God His inheritance in my heart, and to see that fulfilled in whatever small purpose I have to see that fulfilled in his people. Otherwise, I don't want to be here, you know. There's no point for me to be here. If just to get saved, then just go ahead and take me out. I mean, that's been accomplished. I have no question about my salvation, but I do know that there is a, a, a kind issue that the Lord is still developing and working on in us, in us all. And that's my heart, is to see the bride of Christ made ready. Really, the overcomer reality that's spoken of in Revelation 2 and 3 is really dear, dear to my heart as well. Uh, that really hits my heart. Um, I think that's the best place. If you're struggling with that whole distinction, which I, I went through that for a little bit. Lord, i got to see this in Scripture, and that's where the Lord took me to, Revelation 2 and 3, and the promises to the overcomers in his own house. If you're struggling with that, really study that out. That will bring a lot of clarity um, to that, and it, it helps. You know, we need the Spirit, and we need uh, the truth. Now, those are synonymous. The Spirit is truth. But God's Word is true, and God is bound to His Word. Um, his interpretation of His Word may be different, but uh, He's bound to His Word. And I don't want to, and you need to do this with me, and ask the Lord if what I'm speaking is truth. You know, we need to have the discernment in the Holy Spirit to be able to hear, digest, and cling to that which is good and get rid of that which is not, you know? 
And uh, just because someone says something that you're, well, I'm not sure about that, or that doesn't line up with my thought, or the Lord hasn't revealed that to me yet, doesn't mean it's not true, and doesn't mean they're a false prophet. I mean, we all see in part, and we can miss it. I can miss it. I've missed it a lot. But uh, the Lord's gracious, but really the, it gets down to a heart of purity and sincerity before the Lord and, uh, and humility. You know, there's a lot of great teachers and preachers, but without the humility of the Lord, I mean, I wouldn't give you a nickel for one of them, honestly. And I meet a lot of people, you know, and it's always, it's not the best, most you know, refined, defined sermons that impress me. It's afterwards getting to hear and talk to someone in a normal conversation when you get to really see their heart, how they interact with people, how humble they are. That's when you know someone is anointed of the Lord, you know. He'll come and do something in the meeting, but that's easy to fake. You know, it really is, honestly, guys. I mean, I mean, I'm not very good at this, Okay. <laughs> I'm not very good at this at all. But the more I've done it, the easier I used to think, well, you know, you could never get up there unless you really were deep with the Lord and really had a heart for God and really knew what you were talking about. That's not true. People do it all the time, more so than not. I mean, that's really, that's, that's some harsh truth right there. And I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. I'm saying even from my own heart. When I started, the Lord started doing this and I used to be so nervous, and I still get a little nervous. I'm so nervous before I get up here, you know, and so I just, Lord, help me, help me, help me. I can't do this without you. I don't even know. Most of the time I get up here, I don't even know what I'm going to say, like what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it goes. But anyways, Lord, help me. And then, you know, the more you do it, the more you get used to it. You don't want to, I never, I mean, Paul said he, he came to, well, this is the Corinthians, in fear and in trembling, afraid to be a reproach and say something that would be a reproach, a reproach to the Lord. I never want that fear to leave my heart. I'm not saying I want my knees knocking every time I get up to preach because I'm nervous to stand in front of people. But before the Lord, I understand to speak as it was the oracles of God incurs a stricter judgment and if you actually look at that word the word there is condemnation that's actually the better interpretation for that word teachers undergo a stricter condemnation before the lord and will have a stricter judgment when they stand before the judgment seat of christ and that doesn't mean that well did you hit all your points on your sermon on your three-point sermon is well, how was your heart before me did you truly want to know me and did you have a heart for my people and that's how jesus confronted Peter at the end of his life. Will you feed my lambs? Will you feed my sheep? Peter was offended, you know, but that was Jesus' question to Peter. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. And we should all have that heart. As we go deeper in the Lord, that doesn't mean we're all meant to speak. There, There are differing functions and differing vocations, and we have to be okay with that. Because that's not what's going to be judged. How many people you got saved is not going to be the judgment of the Lord. I'm not saying there's no reward for that. But what your judgment is going to be on is John 17, the knowing of the Lord Jesus. And your obedience to his word after that. Whatever that is. That doesn't mean, and you could save 10,000 people or one person. Or nobody. The Lord can tell you to go be a recluse up in the mountains. Just be before his presence and be an intercessor. How many people have been an intercessor and changed nations without ever standing before men? There's things that can be done in the spirit that can't be done, you know, even in the going and in the flesh. And to the level that you have intercessors, this is part of the purpose of this body, to the level you have true intercessors surrounding you, those who are being sent is to the level of the effectiveness. And they will, the intercessors will share in the reward of those who would perceivably be reaping in the harvest. The intercessors, if not more so, will see more of a reward before the Lord, just as the one who's sent stands up in the pulpit and, you know, as we would see it, gets all the glory. So be, really ask the Lord. I, I, I believe, I believe this is true. The Lord is going to have a people that are one. 
one in him, not one with, in our flesh, one in the spirit, the Lord is going to be able to flow through that people like he never has before. Now, having said that, I still, I see this in the Bible, and I don't see this changing. I still believe there are differing functions. The hand doesn't want to be the foot, and the mouth shouldn't want to be the big toe. But everyone should personally seek the Lord. What is my part to play? It's just a mission. Ministry or whatever that is, that's just a missional thing. It's very small in the grand scheme comparatively to relationship with Jesus Christ and intimacy with Jesus Christ. That is, should be our heart. That should be our goal. That should be our purpose um, is to be intimate with the Lord. And everything else is just gravy. Whatever the Lord wants to do after that. Because if we go out and just try to stir up a bunch of good works in and of ourselves, it's just going to be wood, hay, and stubble before the Lord. The gold, the silver, the precious stones, that's lasting. And that, think about this, gold, silver, precious stones, those things are unseen to the natural eye. Those things are hidden beneath the earth. That's not the flashy as we would see it. Wood, hay, stubble, that's above the ground. It's above the earth. That's not hidden in caves or whatever you want to say. That's seen. That's all burned up. Stuff that comes from man and wants to be seen, that whole thing is going to be burned up before the Lord. Be judged harshly. Intimacy with the Lord. Seeking the Lord. Gaining His heart. Being conformed into His image. That's God's purpose. That's God's plan. We've talked about it today. I was going to bring that scripture out. Romans 8, 29. Predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. The Lord spoke to me. We prayed that today. Spoke to me that a while back. You know... So much is talked about being created to the, into the image, you know, man was in Genesis. But the creation into the image was to the purpose of conformity to the image of the Son. That was a beginning act. That was a capacity statement. You have the capacity to be conformed into the man Christ Jesus. We have this earth and in earth, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That would be about him, not ourselves. And that the truth? Christ in you, the hope of glory. No glory outside of Christ. To the measure Christ is glorified, we receive in turn. So, uh, getting back uh, on topic, Levit Leviticus 10, we talked last week about um, a strange fire and uh, the sin of offering strange fire before the Lord. And I wanted to start off, um, and I mentioned this a little bit last week, but in Leviticus 16, um, God prescribes how the fire was to be administered on the golden altar in the, uh, in the holy place. Uh, before the, uh, you know, the, the golden altar stood right outside the veil, as you were entering into the Holy of Holies um, before the Ark of the Covenant and all that was contained in that. And we would say that that was um, before pictured the throne of God. I want you to think about that, the golden altar that's pictured before the throne of God. And uh, the fire was to be taken from the bronze altar or the brazen altar and transferred through fire pans and censers to... Uh, the golden altar, before the Holy of Holies, in the, whole, the most holy place. Um, so part of Nadab and Abihu's sin was to offer strange fire, to mix. We talked about this last week in Exodus 34, I think it was, um, the sweet incense and all that. You guys remember that when I butchered those names about the spices? Those, to my defense, those spices, no, they no longer know what those spices were. So for me to be able to uh, interpret those and say those words would have been very difficult because they no longer exist. So that's my defense of that. And plus, it's a good way to the Lord to keep you humble. Yeah. Well, that's right. So the point is that Christ was representative of that incense. So when Nadab and Abihu mixed fire that was not given of the Lord with Christ. Let's just bring it into our time. 
there was judgment, and there was immediate judgment. So I want to go a little bit deeper into that. Um, Leviticus 6.13 says, and I'm not going to turn there, but that the fire was never to go out. Every morning, the priests would throw wood on the altar, on the bronze altar, at the brazen altar. That was the altar of sacrifice. The holy altar, or the golden altar, was the, go- the altar of incense, where Christ symbolically was offered um, before the Lord, and the sweet smell of the incense went up into the nostrils of God. The, the sacrificial altar represented, I'm just going to jump here, the salvific realm. It was in the outer court. It was not in the inner court. Leviticus 6.13 says, Do not let the fire go out. Continually, every morning, add wood to the fire. Which would represent, side note, our flesh. Continually adding to the altar of God and to the fire. Leviticus 9.24, and I just mentioned this briefly. I skimmed over this. Leviticus 9.24, and honestly, before I started studying this, I did not... um, know this, but fire came out from the presence of the Lord to consume that altar. That was the fire that the Lord in Leviticus 3, again, see the, see the Lord's purpose in this, step by step by step, revealing what he's doing. He's not giving them the whole plan in advance. He's requiring them to listen and to be patient and to be obedient. That was the sin of Nadab and Abihu was to act before the Lord had spoken in Leviticus 10. Now I find that interesting. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord, so God supplied the fire. It was the fire of the Lord that was meant to be mixed at the golden altar of incense with Christ Jesus, versus the fire that Nadab and Abihu offered, which was strange fire. We don't know the source that it came from, but it said this, it came from the mind of man, and it came from what man wanted to do, versus God's order and what God wanted to do. So incense was to be offered at the golden altar. So it says right here in Leviticus 16, Let's skim this a little bit because I, I, I love the imagery. All this is imagery to us. And again, Jack's right in what he said. All this is imagery. Uh, here we go, verse 4. Let's start in verse 3. Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, with a bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic. Well, that sounds a lot like put on Christ, doesn't it? And then the linen undergarments, which shall be next to his body. And he shall be girded with the linen sash and attired with the linen turban. These are holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water and put them on. Complete purity in everything. And he shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Then Aaron shall offer the bull for the sin offering, which is for himself, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tent of meeting, and Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell and make it a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the, as the scapegoat. Now, much like how Christ was sent outside the city, the scapegoat was sent outside uh, into the wilderness. I just, you know. I, again, I'm not pointing, I don't want to use these scriptures to try and add to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. That's not my heart, and if it was, that would be heretical. My heart here is to show uh, spiritual symbolism in the journey of fire. Let me say that in the be- right here at the beginning. Spiritual symbolism in the journey of fire, and what this means for us 
from our journey from the outer court to the inner court, from our journey from the place of salvation and receiving the grace of God through faith, the completed work of Christ, justification as we would call it, to sanctification. That would be what most of the church would, ex- they would accept that doctrine or that theology. Most of the church, not all the church. But what they won't accept is that there's a difference between children and sons. There's a difference between just the church, those who are called out, and the bride, those who are married to the Lord, those who overcome. So I just want you to get that picture, and that's where I'm going with this, is the symbolism in the sin of Nadab and Abihu was not to recognize that in that journey, from the outer to the inner court, there is a restriction of God that comes as we go, as we go through the process. I say this because we're going through that as a people. There is a restriction, and as the body of Christ, the Lord is desiring all his people to undergo it. There is a restriction that comes that may not make sense, but must be obeyed if we're to go on. If we're to press into what the Lord wants. I firmly believe that. I, I, and the reason I feel like I can share it here initially, because I do believe that this church is meant to be a, f- in, uh, a forerunner in the forerunning spirit of the Lord in this. And by us getting out, it will help in the spirit others to get out through prayer, through example, whatever that is. What won't help others is for us to get heady and think it's about us and it's something good that we've done. That'll kill it quicker than anything because God resists the proud. He gives His grace to the humble. That's why we can't ever move past repentance, quick to repent. I'm not saying just run around repenting for things you haven't done. I'm talking about brokenness before the Lord, being a broken vessel before the Lord continually. That has to be, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it, part of the mix of what the Lord's doing. And if we want the glory, we're going to have to have the fire, and the fire is going to purify, and it's going to show us our stuff, and it's going to break us. (laughs) It should break us. If it doesn't break us, then we're in real pro- we, have, we have real problems. We're in real trouble. Um, anyways, let's continue on here. Uh, then Aaron shall offer the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. Now here it is. And he shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar before the Lord. Now, this is symbolically in heaven. We see this in Isaiah 6, where the seraphim takes the coal from the altar. That would be the golden altar, which stands before the throne of God in the temple of heaven, where the throne is. Uh, The Psalms say that clearly. Um, And touches Isaiah's lips to purify him, um, to speak, and to be sent. If we're going to be sent, both... uh, geographically and spiritually, we're going to have to be purified. We're going to have to have that coal, and we're going to have to carry that coal. Verse 12, And he shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from above the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the fire, or he shall put the incense, excuse me, on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the ark of the testimony, lest he die. And this is beautiful. I was, let's just read this because it's beautiful and it's speaking of our Lord. Moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side and also on the front of the mercy seat. He shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Seven being the number of completion that Christ fulfilled. Um, So, as we travel from the outer court to the inner court, we must expect this continued restriction. We must 
come to grips with the fact that the Lord's going to have his hand on us more so than maybe some other people we know or some people that are surround us. And we're going to have to be okay with that. Not being okay with that and resisting is going to abort part of the God's plan for this body, really individually, but for this body. What we have, here's, here's what we have. The Lord is speaking this, this wholehearted devotion to the Lord all over the world, and people are picking it up. What we don't have is a group of people who are walking in this together. That's the problem. And that's where God is always going to push it. He didn't stick with Abraham. He pushed for the children of Israel. Right? No man is an island. And God doesn't want an island. He wants a body. He wants a people. He wants a full testimony. And God's too diverse to have his full testimony in one person. He's got to have a group. That's what we haven't seen. You know, Hebrews 11, praise God for that chapter. If you want encouragement, go to Hebrews 11. Read about the men and women of God who've gone before it. It says in Hebrews 11, they were men and women of whom the world was not worthy. I love that verse. I want to be a part of that, that group. That is the bride through the ages. There's confusion about that. People are, well, you know, is, is anyone in the bride? Do you have to know the doctrine of the bride to be in the bride? No. Emphatically, no. That doesn't make sense. Most of us just started seeing that reality, what, a few years ago. What you need is a heart that's laid down before the Lord and is seeking total union with the Lord. That means death to self and complete life in Christ. There have been many, 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 many people, myriads upon myriads of people who have come into that reality. Having said that, I do believe that the Lord will have more people in this final hour come into that. The bride will be made ready more so now in this hour than it ever has been before. But what we don't see, and this is another part of that, what I think we're going to see, and what we need to see, is not just individuals. What you have in Hebrews 11 is individuals that are in that place with the Lord. What we want to see is a body who's in that place with the Lord. Amen? So we need to go together. No man is left behind unless that man or woman wants to be left behind. Here in this body, I said some things last week about if you're not supposed to be here, don't be here. If you don't have the vision, don't stay here. That wasn't meant to be harsh. The Lord is completely gracious and kind to get us there if we want to be there. That's my point. You know, and I'm not saying, well, if you're not there yet, get out. I'm not there yet. Lord knows that. But I want to have a heart to get there. I want to be quick to repent. And when my flesh rises up and fights that, when the soul tries to dominate my spirit and discourages me, I want to come before the Lord and be quick to repent, quick to humble myself, quick to ask the Lord to give me vision and to have faith in what He's already said. Sometimes we don't need new vision. Sometimes we just need to believe in the Word of the Lord. And continue to walk, even if we can't see. Sometimes the Lord asks you to be like a child. And just rely on Him step by step by step. To eat when He tells you to eat. To sleep when He tells you to sleep. To do whatever else babies do. I'm not going to say that because it's too graphic. I'm learning that. I've got a little month. Or, <laughs> one month and one week old over there. But we need to get rid of some of the junk that's inside of us internally we need to be purged of some of that stuff and it's not going to look nice and it's not going to be a fragrant aroma in the nostrils of the lord i'll tell you that <laughs> sorry that's too far that's not as bad as dad though honestly i didn't say jackass so we're okay i just did sorry sorry son So, <laughs> getting back here, Nadab and Abihu uh, didn't perceive this reality. 
Now, in their time, obviously, we're talking about a spiritual reality now. In their time, they didn't have that revelation, but they did have the revelation of, of the Lord in what to do, what not to do. They didn't expect that their misstep would cost them their lives and that they would be written. I mean, think about this. They're written down in the annals of the Scriptures multiple times. Numbers 3, Chronicles 24, that they offered strange fire before the Lord, that they sinned before the Lord and were struck. There's other people in the New Testament who are written down. Paul writes them down explicitly. Forever named in the Word of God. Of course, there's a lot of men and women who are on the positive side of that, written down more so in the eyes of the Lord, who the Lord will remember for, forever. But they didn't perceive that as they made this journey to the throne, let's just go there, to the throne, because we're all destined for the throne. Revelation 3, I quoted that last week. To the overcomers, I will grant you to sit down on my throne. That's either true or it's not true. Amen? That's hard for us to go there. It's either true or it's not true. But in that journey, that their own stuff, their own way, their own twist on doing what they thought the Lord wanted to do would cost them. And a part of that, um, in Numbers 3 and First Chronicles 24, I'll just say it, part of what the Lord says there about Nadab and Abihu is that they had no sons and they had no offspring. That their name would not be perpetuated. There would be no posterity for them throughout the ages. They were struck. They were slain. Now, this sin of Nadab and Abihu is very prevalent in our day. It's very prevalent in the body of Christ. And when we come to, into a season of time like this, the Lord looks to make a statement. As he did in Acts 5, I, clo- I quoted that last week briefly. What was the sin of Ananias and Sapphira? They held back from the Lord. There's other parts to it. But when it really boils down, in the midst of the Lord coming and moving and building a people, and the glory of the Lord coming, they decided to keep some back from themselves. And Peter tells them, while it was your, while you know you still had it, it was all yours. And even when you sold the property, it still remained under your control. You did not lie to man; you lied to the Holy Spirit. But the point is that they held back their land or the profit from their land. Now, you can take that and say, how much do we hold back from the Lord in the land or the ground of our own hearts? Are we holding back from the Holy Spirit? That's not meant to be harsh. That's meant to be a reality check, though, to us all, to myself. Lord, what in me am I holding back from you that you deserve? Because we're not our own. We all remember that, right? We've been bought with a price. Therefore, we glorify God in our bodies. The Holy Spirit is really checking our hearts right now. And He's going to be doing things. He has been in me. The Lord, honestly, has given me a little bit of a reprieve the last few months. And some of these things he's asked me to do that just, again, we talked about it before, not sinful things, just things, just complete obedience. This is what I tell you to do, do it. The Lord's checking our hearts. What will we hold back from the Lord? What will we offer in place of him? I want to jump to Isaiah 4. Because if we want the glory, and if we want the canopy, we're going to have to have the fire and the burning of the Lord. It's a requirement. Isaiah 4 says, Starting in 
Start in verse 3. Let's start in verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful. I believe that this is a prophecy. I believe it's been fulfilled in part, but it is a prophecy. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and adornment of the survivors of Israel. And it will come about that he who is left in Zion, again, there's going to be a people in Revelation 14 who are standing on Mount Zion with the Lord. That's a spiritual relationship. Whatever it is, literally, which there's a literalness, whatever point in time that is, those people are standing with the Lord in Mount Zion because of their relationship. Well, Psalm 125, those who trust in the Lord are as of Mount Zion. That's Zion, those who trust in the Lord. Verse 3, and it will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. I'd love to be called that right now, you know? Oh, look, we got a demon visitor. (laughs) I hope no one's allergic to wasps. And it will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst. Here's the key, by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, or the spirit of fire, you could say. Then, notice it's after this, then this, and I want to bring this in because this is the process we're in here. We are being purged as the daughters of Zion of our own filth and our own stuff their own flesh. And after this purging and burning, and this continued purging and burning, the Lord will create, this is a promise, okay? I want you to see this as verse 5 and 6 is the promise. Verse 4 is how we get there. I know we would like it to be the other way. We'd like, <laughs> we'd like it to be flipped. Or we'd like to just take verse 4 out altogether. But verse Four is the requirement, is the necessity. Verse 5, Then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke, and the brightness of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory will be a canopy. Praise God. And there shall be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day and refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. That is the promise of the Lord to his people, to those who trust in him. Part of the reason we haven't seen that yet is because we haven't found the people who are willing to undergo the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. And it's a long, long, long process from point A to point B. It's a long process. And it's so easy to go, even as this body has, it's so easy to go two or three or four years, and, and it's hard, and it's real, it's, you know, and be like, Lord, are we past this judgment and this burning yet? And I might mean judgment, I mean the Lord discerning our hearts and moving to purify. That's what I'm saying. And the, the reality is, is we're not. You know, the Lord spoke to me last week, and I said that he's creating in us a new wineskin to hold his wine. So it comes to us, you know, and to the body of Christ in this time is, the question is, are we going to stay with the Lord in this? Are we going to remain? Are we going to flee? Are we going to run? Are we going to look for that which appeases our own flesh and sounds good and and I know I, I know this and I'll be honest it's so sometimes we think well I'm way past that that's not true <laughs> not true in my own heart there's been times where I just want to reprieve just Lord <laughs> some smooth words speak gently to me and not that he doesn't individually I and I'm not again and dad said this and I agree 
I'm secure in the love of God. I know that the love of God is causing what he's causing. That he loves us enough to judge us and to purify us because he has a goal and he has a purpose. If he left us, if he left us as we were, you know, there is no marriage supper. There is no union. There's only either stay away or even in the salvific, it's a very minimal aspect of what the Lord wants. So praise God, he loves us. So the more you get beat on, the more God loves you. How about that? <laughs> partly true. It's a crude way to say it, but it's partly true. So from verse uh, chapter 4 in Isaiah, we're talking about the burning, the purging. And uh, I just wanted to bring this scripture again into the New Testament. John 15. Yeah, John 15. I'll read it. Starting verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it or cleanses it, that it may bear more fruit. That's an encouraging thought. A little bit harsh, less harsh way to say what I've been saying. You know, many of us have borne fruit for the Lord and borne a measure of fruit to the Lord. It is the goodness of God to prune us. It, it seems like death and destruction and mayhem and chaos. But it's actually the love of God that more of His Son, more of His life can come forward. And He's doing that to our body. He's pruning. That may, that may come in numbers, that may maybe more so in a spiritual reality, whatever that is, but the Lord is pruning. And then the other uh, thing the Lord spoke to me this week was 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and, and really Galatians 5, 9, about leaven. Um, I'll, I'll read them both just real quick. Again, I can't hit all the context, but I, I, I'm reading these out of context this way because I felt like the Lord was speaking to us specifically and in line with this message. Verse 7, clean out the old leaven. In context, just in context, this is talking about getting someone out of their midst who is in sin. Okay, so we talked a little bit about that last week. A man had taken his father's wife, which would have been his mother, so it was an incestuous relationship, and was sleeping with her in the house of God. But Paul says, you know, clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened, for Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. And then in Galatians 5, verse 9, where I'm going. And we may read some more Galatians here. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. A little mixture can cause great destruction. That's my point. As we were reading in Leviticus 10, one thing can bring major destruction. The Lord is wanting to remove every bit of leaven that's in our hearts. I truly believe that. I truly believe, believe that's possible. Some people don't. Some people believe, you know, you're just always going to be extremely faulted. And, you know, and I, I'm, again, I believe the Lord uses it. The Lord uses it. And the Lord keeps you humble. But at the same time, I mean, the question comes, can we be conformed to the image of Christ? And to what measure is that available? I don't see a stoppage in the scriptures. I don't see you can be conformed partly to the image of Christ or halfway or three quarters. When the scripture says, be conformed to the image of Christ, be made in his likeness, I believe that's fully available. I don't think the Holy Spirit would ever stop 
trying to reproduce the Son of God in a person or in a people. I choose to believe that. People would, some people would take problems with what I'm saying, but I, I don't think you can if you use the Scripture that way to back it up. The Holy Spirit is never going to stop. He's going to make a bride ready for the Son. As Eliezer went and got a bride for Isaac, the Holy Spirit is going to get a bride for Jesus Christ. And it's going to please the heart of the Father. And He's going to look and love upon that union. What does that all look like? I don't know. I can't wait to find out. I don't know what that all means to be have a marriage step with the Lamb and be completely united with the Lord. I, sounds great. Sign me up. <laughs> but I believe it. Because the Word says it. I just want to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. And I think we need to really press in and ask the Lord to help us. Let's continue in Galatians. Um, because... I think when you get some, practically speaking, there's some encouragement here. Uh, I have confidence. It, the book of Galatians is mostly refuting uh, continuing to practice Old Testament law, honestly. Um, but verse 10 says, I have confidence in you and the Lord that you adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Talking about trying to get them to go back to circumcision, which Paul says, if if you receive curse and circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. You'll be severed from Christ. Um, in verses 4. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision or flesh, let's just say that, or am I, why am I still being persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. Would that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only, here we go, do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is impossible to do without the love of God in you by the Spirit. But if you bite and devour one another, again, dealing with the tongue here, we talked about this some last week. We need the, we need, I need the Lord to really purify my tongue. Something I've been praying and asking the Lord, Lord, take my own opinion away from me. If I belong to the Lord, I have no right to my own opinion anymore. And it's a mixture but if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. He's talking to Christians here. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Let's just all nod on that one. That's right. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Praise God. I want to bring in another verse here, Romans 8.14. I love this verse. It says, All those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. That's what the Lord's pushing. A people that are so aligned, so united with the Spirit of God. Number one, that they don't think, do the things that they would in and of themselves desire or that would please them, but they would please the Lord in everything they do. These are the sons of God. Sons have a heart for the Father. That was Jesus' heart. He did, only did what he saw the Father doing. He only did what pleased the Father. His heart was my, not my will, your will be done, Lord. That's to be our heart. He was an example. He was a forerunner. He didn't have his eyes 
on the miracles that were coming through him. He didn't have his eyes on the ministry. He had his eyes on the Father. We are supposed to have our eyes on Jesus Christ. In every bit is the same way. And that, in fact, that's the only way we can walk, is to have our eyes on Jesus Christ, and walking by the Spirit. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. We all know these, but I think it's good to talk about them, or at least read them, because this is under conjecture from people all over. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, which you can put anything you love above the Lord or desire above the Lord into the category of idolatry, not just worshiping idols. Sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy. Can't compare ourselves in the body of Christ, guys. One to another. Not the heart of God. Outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, or factions, which are heresies. Envying, there you go, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things or live a lifestyle and such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit, this is the John 15 fruit, of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. We're talking about staying in it with the Lord, faithfulness. This is a fruit of His Spirit. Gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Well, that sounds like an absolute, but verse, 20 says, verse 25 says, If we live by the Spirit, if we have been born again, born of Spirit, not of flesh, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful challenging one another, envying one another. The Lord is pressing us into that life. Life by the Spirit and not in the flesh. And it's going to take the John 15 pruning to get us there. I really believe that. It's going to take a holiness from the Lord that's produced by His very own nature within us that we presently are not walking in. Speaking of myself. And if we remember Ephesians 5.27 and this is echoed in Colossians 1.22 I'm just going to read these. This is the heart of Jesus Christ, that he may present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in fleshly body, through death, in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. There's a passage in the book of Revelation, (coughs) chapter 15, verse 2. You know, sometimes it's good, I'm kind of saying this as we've gone along, it's good to see the prophetic promises of God to encourage us. 
And I want to encourage us. You know, when you start talking about people who are getting struck by fire for doing their own thing and having their own way, sometimes it's easy to get your head down a little bit. I don't want you to get your head down. I want you to get your head up, get your eyes up on the Lord. If we'll go here with the Lord, Revelation 15, verse number 2, we're going to end with this. We'll end a little bit early today. You know, in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the burning, in the midst of the, the judgment of the Lord on our hearts, individually, corporately, as a body, and it gets hard, and it gets hot, and it hurts. And I'm not giving you sympathy, because I'm in it too. We don't need sympathy, but we do need encouragement to stay in it. We encourage one another. Right, Kathleen? That's what you're talking about this morning. Encourage one another spiritually to press on. And there's a people. We could go several different places in Revelation. This one just hit me this week. I was reading it. I've been studying the book of Revelation again. Um, Chapter 15, verse number 2. And I saw, this is John seeing, and I saw as it were a sea of glass which speaks of transparency. This is before the throne. Mixed with fire. I dare say there's a spiritual symbolism that where these people are standing is what's, what was both needed to get them there and a spiritual reality of where they are with the Lord. I say that because a sea of glass representing transparency and the fire that made them transparent, that cleansed them. And you have to have fire to get glass. And those who had come off victorious from the beast and from his image and from the number of his name. Again, this, I believe, in the literalness of there being a literal beast and an image and the number of his name. But we are spiritually the harlot who sits on the beast, the spirit of Babylon, fighting that now. We don't have to be a part of the last generation as we would see it, to be a part of this group. Amen? You guys believe that? I really believe that. Every time we resist our own flesh and resist the spirit of the age and press into the Lord, we are overcoming the beast and his image and the number of his name. Every time we press into Christ's life, humble ourselves before the Lord, we see growth. That is, a sh- that is crippling to the enemy and his plans. It's crippling to darkness. As light grows, it displaces and dispels darkness. So I just want you to see that. Victorious. That's a beautiful word. There is going to be a people that's going to be victorious. Not defeated, not down, not beaten down, victorious by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony who did not love their life unto death. A victorious people, a victorious bride, a group of overcomers who have come into that life, the overcoming life of the Lord in union. And they'll be standing on a sea of glass holding harps of God and they sing the song of Moses, the bondservant of God and the song of the Lamb saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God, the Almighty, righteous and true are thy ways, thou King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name. For thou alone art holy. For all the nations will come in worship before thee. For thy righteous acts have been revealed. Amen. Lord, we say yes to you in that, Lord. We say yes to your dealings to get us to that place where we can stand victorious with you before your throne. We may stand complete with you, Lord. You said in the book of Revelation to one of the churches that I don't find your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Lord, complete those works. Complete your work, your inward work of the testimony and the revelation of your Son in us. 
that we may stand holy and blameless before you, Lord, that we may be presented to you a glorious bride without spot or without wrinkle. Lord, we welcome your fire to do that. We say no to the flesh, no to the, Lord, the false fire. We say yes to your fire, Lord Jesus Christ. That you would have what you want, Lord. That we would please your heart. Holy Spirit, there would, there would be no more grieving of you. There would be pleasing you. Lord, encourage our hearts today. Lord, as we go from here, let there be an encouragement. Not in and of ourselves, but in, in you. In who you are. In your plan, in your purpose. Lord, in your victory. And in the reality that we're supposed to come into that victory with you. We love you, Lord. Let us journey on this journey of fire with you. Let us fear your name. Lift up holy hands, as Paul told the men of God. Lift up holy, I want you to lift up holy hands to the Lord. Lord, that our prayers and our walk would not be hindered in any way. Purify us, Lord. As his sister said, he, who can ascend into the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart not lifted up his soul to falsehood. Lord, we don't lift our soul up to falsehood. We lift it to you for your cleansing. For your greater indwelling deep within our inner man. You would have that holy habitation in us, Lord. In this time, in this people, in this nation, throughout the nations, Lord. Not a hundred years from now, that we would stand with you in victory, Lord, in this life and throughout eternity, as we will. We commit ourselves afresh to you today, anew. Lord, if we've been off, if we've been out of alignment, Lord, we repent of that right now. Lord, I repent of that, and we ask you to bring us into alignment. Bring us into your heart. Give us your vision. Let your light, Lord, Bring light to our eyes and to our hearts. Cleansing, purifying, refining light and fire.